you're losing your regular job, losing your regular income. I was a very nice position. I was one of the youngest directors, London board directors made. You know, I had a lovely company car. Um, I had shares. I had all the things. And let's face it, the status of, you know, what do you do? Well, I'm a director of Sotheby's. That's a, that's a, that's a, it's a very nice social uh, tag to have. Um, to then go back to just being a, you know, what are you? Well, I'm a dealer and I trade out of my apartment. Oh, really? Okay. Um, so that was tough. From our Carter. This is The Bigger Picture, an inside look at the businesses that make the art world work and the stories behind the people that shape them. Founded by Robert and Michelle Bowman in 1993, today Bowman Sculpture is synonymous with one name in particular, Rodin. Raised on a farm, starting out as a receptionist and rising through the ranks to become the director of European works of art at Sotheby's to then leave at the height of his career to open his own gallery. Robert's story is inspiring and evidence that with enough persistence, passion and patience, an art world outsider can become a significant voice. So you're not from an artistic background. You can't paint or sculpt. You've got no formal education and you had no connections to the art world. And the only reason, correct me if I'm wrong, that you didn't become a farmer was because your middle brother took up the position leaving you to find something else so the question is how did you make that first step from a farm in Kent well I think if I'm honest uh, 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 when I saw how hard my father worked and I'd worked a bit on the farm I realized that probably that wasn't the ideal career for me my middle brother did thank goodness come home and take over the family farm so that took away the uh, responsibility from me and my other brother but in reality, um, I just saw how incredibly hard farmers work. So um, that was that. It, having experienced that, I think I, I was looking for something else. And how how did you go from the farm in Kent though to 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 working in in the world of fine art? Were you serious about pursuing a future in in art, or did you see Sotheby's as a as a stopgap? How did that? How did you transition from the farm into into the art world? Well, originally I was fairly alternative and did had lots of strange jobs, including working as a lifesaver in a swimming pool and various things like that. And um, eventually my father said to me, look, you know, I've given you a great education, but you really do need to do something with it. So I went off and actually started accountancy. Um, and unfortunately, I hated it. I decided that that wasn't for me. I then completed my first year. I do actually have my part one in accountancy, my foundation course, which has actually stood me very well in it had stood me well in business, I must say. I can look at a set of accounts uh, and understand them, so that's good. But um, the, the the initial introduction was actually a friend of my parents who happened to work at Sotheby's. I said I wasn't doing anything, and he said, have you ever thought about the art world? And I said, no. And he said, well, um, I'll see if I can get you a, job, a temporary job. So I got a temporary job as a porter for the first big house sale, which was Lord Rosebery's estate. It's called the Mintmore Towers sale. And I was a porter for that, taken on as a temporary guy. And you progressed from being a porter to working on reception, which involved what exactly? Um, in those days, lots of things used to come in via off the street. People would just walk in and say, I've got this, can you tell me what it's worth? Um, really long before the advent of, of emails and photographs, um, electronic photographing so we had a lot more things coming in off the street and there were four reception counters and each reception counter had two receptions receptionists on it and people would bring things in and then it was down to the receptionist to call the relevant expert down right okay so the question is i think um i've been dug into this a little bit into your background who was colin mckay and how did he yeah. have an impact on you there's a wonderful guy called Colin Mackay, and he was head of the um, Ch Chinese department. And um, he used to give me an incredibly hard time because they were on the third floor and the Japanese were on the fourth floor and there was no lift. So uh, he, if I called him down to look at a plate and it was Japanese and not Chinese, and that's, trust me, that's often quite difficult, he would go ballistic with me. So um, there was one classic occasion <clears throat> when nervously asked him to come down and have a look at a plate and he came down and he said oh yes Robert this is very nice it's uh, 
Chinese, 18th century. He told me who the owner is. I introduced him to the owner. The owner stood up and he picked up the plate and he said, well, this is absolutely beautiful. This is Chen Lung, probably about 1730, 1732. Not earlier because it's got this little pink decoration around the outside. And really, you only really see the introduction of this pink color after about uh, 1730. And uh, if we turn it over, I can see from these particular firing marks on the back of it, so from the northern part of the province. And he went on and on and on about this place. And I just thought, God, you are magical. And then he turned around to the owner and said, um, well, a single plate like this, I would have thought perhaps three, four thousand pounds. Um, do you have more than one? And she said, actually, yes, I've got uh, I've got 10 of them. And he said, oh, that's marvelous. There's a large group like that. They're worth much more. And I would have thought that probably we could have been thinking of somewhere around 50 to 60,000 pounds at auction for the set. Would you like to auction them? And she said, oh, I'd love to. And there was this he had this combination of this incredible authority. He was beautifully dressed in the kind of Savile Row suit and the whole thing. And I just thought, I want to be you. I want to be the guy that could just walk down, look at something, and with utter confidence, tell them just by looking at it where where it's from, what it's all about, and of course, what it's worth. Mm-hmm. So you almost, you, what was that next step from there then? So you, you, you're blown away by your experience with, with, with Colin Mackay and mm. what he represents. You almost feel that your future is some somehow bound to that or similar to that. So while working on reception, if, correct me if I'm wrong, but you applied to be a junior cataloger for every post that came up. What happened? Yeah, no, that was the thing. Well, basically, I just applied for everything. And I would go for an interview and they'd say, so tell me, what do you know about medieval manuscripts? <laughs> and I would say, well, absolutely nothing, but I'm a quick I'm a quick learner. And they said, so uh, so tell me about your interest in, in Japanese ceramics. And, you know, do you have a degree in, uh, in Japanese works of art? And I said, you know, I don't even have an, o, an art O level, but I can learn. I'm a fast learner. And so they all just shoo shooed me away. And then... Um, Eventually, I camped outside one particular director's office every day um, during my lunch hour, and um, I just drove him mad. And eventually, he said, "Oh, for goodness' sake!" So he phoned up um, the the, um, the personnel department and just said, "Look, for God's sake, give this guy a job." So I got a I got a I got this permanent job um, working on the counters, and from then on, I continually applied for numerous jobs and. Um, Eventually, someone in valuation said, look, you don't have any great specialist knowledge, but you, you seem to be very keen. So what we're going to do is we're going to put you in as a junior in a, in a series of, of departments so that you can educate your eye generally. And then you'll join the valuations department. And the valuations department are people who are sent out around the country to look at large houses or collections of things. And they then say, right, they then spot things, see if something's really worth seeing, and then if it is, you then get the, 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 the top specialist down to have a look at it. But obviously, you can't send a specialist out all around the country. You have to send a general value around, and that general value, then it's their eye that then allows them to decide whether it's the right, it's worth calling a serious specialist in or not. And during that time when you were sort of experiencing this, was there anything that stood out in your mind initially while you were working in valuations what sort of things caught your eye during that time well i i originally you started the majority of things then were furniture so i started in the furniture department and then in 18th 18th century english and french furniture and then um i then went down to the 19th century where i was looking at 19th century furniture but also works of art clocks watches sculpture everything like that and it was during that period that i suddenly thought there's a big area here in sculpture which is treated as decoration at this stage, but in fact it is actually fine art. And there's really sh- it, it, this is worth having a specialist department to represent it. And that's really what started my complete passion for sculpture. That I realised that this was an area that really was just sort of lumped in with furniture and works of art. Um, and I really felt it, it, it was worth having its own specialist area. Mm. So that feeling of, of this um, having its own area of specialism, was there anything emotional, though, that drew you to, to sculpture at that age that kind of blew you away? Yes, I think um, I think that what I'm always looking for in sculpture, and this is a kind of recurring theme going through my what became my passion, is the fact that when you look at something and it has an emotional effect on you, and it's all very well looking at painting. I get pleasure from looking at paintings or, or, or and fine art generally. But the fantastic thing about sculpture is it's three-dimensional. It has to work from the front, the back, 
and the sides. And I've suddenly thought to myself, you know, this is so much more skillful than portrayal just in, in, in two dimensions. And the combination of that, what I perceived as an incredible skill, and the fact that a lot of this sculpture produced in me an emotional reaction, which when I talked about it and explained it to other people, they seemed to see it in the same way that I saw it. And I think it was that that really cemented my passion for the subject, that you know, when you have the ability to look at something and tell people what you see in it, and they then see it after you've explained it to them, you become a conduit for their passion for, for, for art. And I think that's really what cemented my own interest in, in the subject. Yeah. So are you at this point when you start to discover sculpture and it really connects with you on an emotional and an intellectual level, are you are you burning the midnight oil now, reading and consuming information? I mean, I guess this is the before the days of the Internet, whereas you've already touched on where everything is now open and everything's kind of accessible. You, How are you acquiring all that knowledge? Um, you're absolutely right. It's basically burning the midnight oil. Um, whenever I wasn't um, at work, um, I took reference books home. We had very extensive libraries. Um, I went to as many museums as I could. I went to many exhibitions as I could. But the key factor, in fact, if I, the most important um, factor, is that in, when you work for the largest auction house in the world, which was Sotheby's at that time, you are seeing a fantastic quantity of things. And when you look at those things, you're also seeing them with senior people around you who can educate you. So I'll pick something up and say, oh, this is very interesting. And then there would always be someone more senior than me with 20, 30 years of experience. You could say, well, actually, Robert, that's this or actually that's that. I remember there was one particular guy who worked at Sotheby's who had a collection of fakes. And that's just what he collected, just fakes. But they weren't copies. They were fakes. They were things that would fool 90% of the population. And I think it's, it's that level of expertise being surrounded by that level of expertise in combination with seeing a fantastic amount of, uh, of things that really educates you fast uh, it, 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 very quickly. So learning on the job, essentially, and burning the midnight oil, those two things combine, you very quickly acquire that um, that knowledge and I guess there are certain things that I feel that are coming through in what you've said there that can't be learnt in books you literally have to pick up feel and touch these things and interact with the object is that does that sound accurate yes I think that's absolutely right I think that's what it is you can't replace um, the years and years and years of looking at something there was a classic case recently where um, a client of mine asked me to go and look at something um, that was coming up at auction. And uh, I went and looked at it for him. And I said, look, it's perfectly genuine, but it's just not really a great example. It's just an average one, and it's just not good enough for your collection. And I went round to supper with him a few weeks later, and um, sure enough, there it was sitting in, in his study. And I said, oh, I'm very surprised that you bought that, considering I told you that, you know, I think it was that great. And he said, oh, but, you know, I spoke to the head of the department, and he said it was the best one he'd ever seen. And I said, you know what? He's 28. I'm 62. It is the best one he's ever seen. <laughs> so true. So true. So, <laughs> but are you, would you, would you say you were drawn to sculpture today for the same reasons that you were back then when you were 28? Or has this changed over time? How does your, how does your eye evolve over time and how do your tastes change? Do they evolve and in what way? I think your tastes change um, with exposure to increasing amounts of art. And also, I think one's taste develops. You know, I remember being very, very passionate about Art Deco things initially because um, they were obviously producing a very strong and obvious emotion. They were very stylish and visually very, very appealing. But over a period of time, uh, that period has become less interesting to me, and I've become much more interested in in the Impressionism um, period, um, and in fact, going towards the modern period. And I think that's just it's like wine, isn't it? Really, you know, we all start off with, you know, I don't know, Matthias Rosé or something like that, and think it's delicious. And then, you know, over a period of time, your palate develops, and I think in the same way, your eye develops with sculpture. Um, and it's, I think that's part of the reason that still keeps me so excited about it that i'm still learning and still finding areas that i really really am I'm passionate about you know which perhaps four or five years ago i might have looked at something and thought well, i just don't get that that's just 
two pieces of steel welded together. And yet now I'm a huge fan of, of, of people like Robert Adams and, and Anthony Caro and people like that who are making relatively abstract sculpture out of pieces of welded steel. I'm now very passionate about that, but I can tell you five years ago, I probably would have thought, well, I don't really get that. <laughs> it's an interesting theme. It's an interesting theme. It feels like um, or like many of the best things in life are essentially what we're saying, but potentially is they're an acquired taste. You acquire the taste over time because of exposure, uh, your experience, your understanding, you know, that, that deep interest or fascination with something you can go through those multiple levels of fascination. Do you think that's accurate? Yes, I think you do. I mean, I think some it's not for everyone. Some people find an area that they like and they love and that becomes their passion and they steep themselves into it. I've got collectors who know more about particular artists than I will ever know. I mean, because it's their great passion. But on the other hand, they don't perhaps have expertise over 200 years um and as uh, and in general I, I think that 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 narrowing is admirable because they have an incredibly specialist knowledge but to me that's limiting i'm i'm always still looking to look and appreciate something new mm -hmm. so let's just go back if if, if i may to, to mm. the, the period in time when you were at sotheby's and you, you you've gone through valuations you've been exposed on the job to all these works of art you can see that sculpture as a as a discipline um is somewhat maligned perhaps maybe that's too strong a word but it's certainly not an area in and of itself it's kind of lumped in with as you said furniture or decorative decorative art in one sense but you then go on to become a junior cataloger eventually becoming director of european works of art for sotheby's what was that transition like and, and what type of things have happened during that period in time can you remember i think it's <clears throat> It's a combination of things. I think it's a combination. Obviously, you're working for a commercial organization, and I had a commercial eye, and I think that's what's allowed me to go on to be a dealer, is that I saw value in things. And I think that it's that ability when something comes in that you can see what it's worth, who it might appeal to. It's an ability to market. The, the, the whole auction world is, is, is a complicated and sophisticated business. Um, but I think my, my value, I think, to the company was that I was able to see potential areas that could be expanded. For instance, one of the things I did completely off field was that I suddenly noticed that people were starting to collect wristwatches. And um, so I went to the senior directors and I said, you know, what? I think we should be selling wristwatches. And they said, what are you talking about? Well, with Sotheby's, we don't sell wristwatches. And I said, well, you know, I think that there is a new market coming up here, with, particularly for men who can't really buy themselves jewellery, but, but want to have something that is distinctive about them that perhaps portrays their sophistication or their wealth or, or whatever it may be. And I said, I think this is going to become a big collector's market. So they said, well, you, know, you go ahead and do it. So I went to a few people who were dealing in the area, put a sale together, and we had a really successful sale of 19... Of watches from 1920 to the 1950s and that 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 has now developed from i started those sales and, and they got so big that they then set up an independent expert and specialist just to deal in that area and now wristwatches completely out um are much much greater of importance financially to the auction arms than 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 ordinary clocks and watches you know regular pocket watches and regular clocks so i think that's where sotheby's perhaps saw my ability was was the ability to develop develop new markets and that's what i did with sculpture i took on different areas promoted particular artists uh, artists who perhaps had been ignored and then reminded the world of through the catalogs and through expertise and through advertising how important that particular artist is and then expanded the value of that artist we then became known as the people that if you wanted to sell work by that artist you should take it to, to Robert Bowman at Sotheby's and we then built that market and I think that's that's why my career path ascended relatively quickly because I had that combination of, of passion for the art but also a commercial eye. Yeah that commercial intellect that I have no idea about your, your connection or history to watches that really is very interesting because that now is a, a, a huge collector's market I mean I'm thinking about um, websites like Hadinki, for example, 
where they you know they, they represent a very very strong international contingent of collectors of, of watches vintage wrist watches in particular um, mm. that's really really fast so what period of time would that have been where you were seeing you had that foresight that commercial intellect to say it was 1982 1982 I held the first yeah 1982 the first sale of, of vintage wrist watches at Sotheby's it was at Sotheby's Belgravia yeah Wow, I had no idea. That is that is really really early. I mean, I think Adinky, which is now um, like I've, I've touched upon, one of the kind of major online voices of of an international watch collecting community. I think that's probably from that was maybe started in two thousand and nine. So wow, nineteen eighty two. Um, but ultimately, you did go on to leave uh, Sotheby's in nineteen ninety three to strike out on your own, as as many are now aware, you, to set up your your own gallery. Um, what prompted you to leave, if, it's, if, if you don't mind, if it's not a real question? No, it, it, it's a series of things. Um, <clears throat> there, were one or two things going, there was one thing going on in my, in my personal life, which, which, which had an effect that I felt that you know, my life was changing. Um, um, but I think secondly, um, from, a, from a sort of Sotheby perspective, I was being increasingly drawn into senior management. So what was happening was that I was effectively losing touch with the objects and becoming more and more, uh, basically moving towards becoming a divisional head, whereby you're in charge of several departments. And I'm not really a corporate man. I'm not a corporate manager. Had I wanted to do that, I would have gone into a corporate structure in business. And I became was becoming increasingly, therefore, a businessman and a manager, a people manager and a business manager, rather than having an everyday touch with the objects and that's what originally drew me to Sotheby's that's what originally drew me drew created my passion in the art world and I realized that if I wanted to continue to do that I had to go back go on my own and become a specialist in in, in a particular area that, that I had a, a niche expertise for and also um, a, a passion for yeah so you were almost by virtue of your success and that commercial commercial aptitude that was saw you become distanced from the thing that you actually wanted to do the most, which was hands-on interaction, as opposed to becoming, uh, as you said, a, a people a manager and a manager of time and, and, and resource and, and so on and so forth. Well, how did you? Um, how, did you right. how did your fa- family react way back in all the way back in Kent? How did they react to you saying, "I'm leaving yeah, Sotheby's"? I, so, yeah, it's it's a, it's a good question, and I think you know initially there was fear. And, you know, I think you're losing your regular job, losing your regular income. I was a very nice position. I was one of the youngest directors, London board directors made. You know, I had a lovely company car. Um, I had shares. I had all the things. And let's face it, the status of, you know, what do you do? I'm a director of Sotheby's. It's a, that's a, that's a, it's a very nice social uh, tag to have. Um, to then go back to just being a, you know, what are you? Well, I'm a dealer and I trade out of my apartment. Oh, really? Okay. Um, so that was tough. Um, so I think certainly worry from from my parents' point of view um, that they felt that, um, you know, I was giving up a potentially um, important career. But um, tremendous faith, I think, in that um, both of my, both my father and my mother recognized, had always recognized in me a wheeler dealer um, aspect, the ability to see something, think, well, that's worth a bit more than that, buy it and sell it. And, and, and also my pleasure in creating new markets and I suppose also being fundamentally being a salesman. And um, I, I, I think that um, they are, hopefully they had faith that, that those skills would, would out. Um, having said that, you know, I think one of the big skills that um, a lot of, dealers need which perhaps people a lot of people leave the auction rooms but then don't make it as independent dealers and i think that that that, that the the key factor there is is having that ability to do a bit of everything to be able to do your accounts to be able to move things to be able to understand advertising to be able to understand all these different things and it's not when you're a dealer it's not just buying and selling that's a that's a an important part of it, a very important part of it, buying right and uh, is the key, and it makes it easier to sell when you bought it right. But there is, when you're running your own business, there are a whole multitude of skills that that, that one has to have, as well as just that ability to, to spot a good thing. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It takes enormous courage to strike out on your own, especially from a position of status and comfort and, and success that you would have had with Sotheby's at that moment in time. I mean, fast forward today, and while your daughter Mika is heavily involved in managing the business, if I'm not mistaken, it was your wife, Michelle. She was very much instrumental uh, in helping develop the business during its first five years, very much the backbone. I'm curious, though, did you both have a vision in mind for Bowman Sculpture back then? Because success never goes in a straight line. It's never night and day. It's going to take a period of time. So how did you evolve the idea for Bowman Sculpture? Uh, I mean, had you been thinking about this idea for a while? Yeah, I, I think <clears throat> what I had was a series of people who I knew were professionals in terms of they were scouting around the world, looking for things that were that they thought were worth more than, than they could buy them for. So I, in a way, I, I had a source over the, the years I was at Sotheby's. I'd obviously developed a, a very nice collection of people who were effectively dealers, but who were working with me at the auction room. And they would work with me because I would promote the objects, I would do the research, I'd take great photographs of the things and promote the thing. And I would then, in the auction, be dealing with the collectors, the people who were the end users for these things. And I would explain to them why something was good and why it was important and all that. So I was a, a conduit between those two. Um, so actually, by leaving some of these, I still had buyers and I still had sellers. So actually, instead of being a conduit for a huge corporation like Sotheby's, um, I was able to go off in my little specialist market and be the conduit just on my own. Mm. Mm, that's fascinating. That's very, very interesting. So let's go back to thinking about launching Bowman Sculpture. Yeah. Who was your first full-time hire? Um, I had, I was very lucky. I had uh, a friend, well, someone I knew in the trade, um, whose whose daughter wanted um, wanted a job, and so I took her on as as a sort of um, sort of secretarial position. I had um, another couple of uh, friends of, of daughters and friends of friends who wanted to do some part time work, and they worked with me on a sort of secretarial basis. Um, but this one lady, her um, her father owned a or had a lease on a gallery in Duke Street in James's. And um, she'd been working for me for about six months. And she said to me, God, you know, my dad's very scared about this recession that's coming. And he just thinks he needs to get out of the gallery. And of course, you know, when I left Sotheby's in 93, we were at the bottom of a really bad recession. The early, early 90s were, were pretty tough times. So I'd left at the kind of bottom of the market as such. And um, he was just scared that it was going to continue on. So he was quite desperate to get out of his lease. And... Um, that was the most lucky thing for me because he said to me, if you take my lease on now, I won't charge you any any um, commission, any, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, you know, there's a, there's a, uh, no, there's a, there's a premium that, uh, that you have to pay if you're taking over someone's lease if it's an advantageous lease, if the lease is below market value. Um, and um, so I was incredibly lucky. He was called Mallorcas and uh, he was a dealer in, in, in textiles and carpets. And he said, look, take my lease over. I'm, I, I think that world's going to go into a much worse place. If you still believe it's going to be on the upturn now, take my lease over. I won't charge you a premium for taking my lease on, but you've got to move in now and take it over. So that's what I did. So um, his daughter, Mimi, um, introduced me to the father on a more serious term. And we I, that was my first gallery at number um, eight, Duke Street St. James's. And of course, things did pick up as things invariably do in time. <laughs> what was the what was the first work that you sold? Do you remember? Yes, I mean, I, I sold a lot of things because initially I didn't have any capital, you know. Um, and the one thing one does need, and even in relatively inexpensive nineteenth-century sculpture at the time, one does need capital. So how I was originally trading was I would go to um, a dealer have a look at their stock and think, oh, that's quite nice. So can I borrow that for a day? I then, because they knew me and trusted me, they'd lend it to me. I then get on taxi or whatever, go up and make an appointment to see a potential client, take it in and say to them, look, I've got this thing. What do you think? And I just try and put my elbows in either way and try and make a little margin between what the dealer wanted and, and what, what the collector um, was prepared to pay. And that's how I really started dealing in the first place was just by borrowing things because I didn't have the capital. 
over a period of time, I then built up the capital. And I remember my first really proper um, piece that I bought with my money and sold was a sculpture by um, someone called Falgier, and it was a sculpture of a, a naked woman called Frin. And it was based on a painting by Jerome, and um, by, by the Orientalist painter Jean-Léon Jerome, peering out from underneath her arm. Other than that, she's completely naked. And so you get this lovely sort of sense of sensuality of this woman saying, oh gosh, I'm naked, and yet very clearly being aware of the effect that she's having on the viewer. And that was the first sculpture I sold, and it's uh, called Frin, and it's by Falgier. That's incredible. I mean, I think more interesting, uh, I think, for, I mean, you are known, your name, the Bowman name, is now synonymous with Rodin. Um, that, is, that The concept alone is, is pretty incredible that you have created um, a brand synonymous with the one name that people so, you know, um, they associate uh, sculpture with Rodin. The two are intrinsically linked. How do you, how do you, how do, does something like that work? How do you create a, a brand and a gallery and a business that becomes synonymous with the one name in sculpture that people connect with? How, how do you do that? Well, in terms of expertise, obviously, I was lucky that I was exposed to incredibly expensive and very beautiful sculptures at Sotheby's. So I learned about the different sculptures, the different foundries, the different qualities, the patinas, and all those things that are important when you're buying a Rodin while I was at Sotheby's. But in terms of establishing oneself as the specialist dealer, it just takes an enormous amount of time. Um, you have to be seen to be dealing in it. You have to be seen at the various art fairs to be holding stock by the artist. And then over a period of time, um, you're seen to be buying things at auction. Um, oh, well, that's, Robert, that's that Robert Berman. He's just bought that, that road down there. Oh, well, he's bought, that's, that's Robert underbidding that road. Down. And so your reputation spreads in the auction world. It spreads amongst dealers. It spreads amongst collectors. And then, of course, now with the internet, someone who's interested in road down will go on. They'll put in road down and they'll see the stock that we're holding um they'll see the various articles that have been written about me and the business over the years and that what we specialize in and then you know, we hold exhibitions and i write um extensive catalogs and produce dedicated catalogs just on Rodin and do dedicated exhibitions and then i'll lend things to museums that i've sold to clients and so over a period of whatever it's been now 27 years you gradually build up that association. And I think now, certainly, hopefully, um, largely amongst the, the, the trade, certainly, and hopefully amongst collectors, people will now say, oh, yeah, Bowman, you know, wrote out, yeah, it's Bowman's, that's the guy who deals with it. Um, and, and I have to say that in the last six months, some of my sig most significant sales have actually been through the auction rooms who have contacted me and said, look, we've got a client looking for a thinker. We've got a client looking for a kiss. What do you have? And because they know I hold stock, they now are now coming to me to say, as the seller, saying, we've got a buyer. Can we be the intermediary? So it's sort of come full circle, really. Full circle, yeah. So just to continue on this thread while we're talking about Rodan, um, a few years ago now at Tefaf, you sold uh, she who she who she who was once the helmet maker's beautiful wife um, to the curator of the Van Gogh Museum, Edwin Becker. Though you credit the sale to your wife, can you tell us what happened there? Um, the sculpture is of a rather sad, aging old woman who's bent over, crippled with arthritis, and. Um, it, 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 it's, I think it's incredibly powerful sculpture. It really reminds us all, if you think of the title, she who was once the helmet maker's beautiful wife. And so it's this indication of this woman who was clearly incredibly beautiful when she was young, but now is bent over, twisted and crippled by age. And she's got she's depicted nude by Rhoda. And she has this sort of sagging flesh and sort of sagging breasts. And the, the sort of skin is sort of hanging off her. Uh, she's very thin and very old. So it's quite a tragic um, sculpture um, and we had it um, sitting on a column with a light shining in front of it and my wife was showing it to someone was turning it round and as she turned it the shadow that it gave from from the front was the shadow of this bent over figure so there was a bent over figure in the shadow 
But she noticed that as she turned it, the shadow, as, as the figure twisted, became the shadow of a beautiful young woman, upright. And I, I don't know, I can't imagine that Rodin uh, uh, created that intentionally, but that's what happened. And the curator of the Van Gogh Museum was on the stand and he was looking at it. And my wife said, look, look at this, isn't this interesting? And he was just completely spellbound by the fact that the shadow changed as you twisted the figure around. It went from this bent over old figure, straightened up and became this rather tall, slim, elegant woman, as indeed the helmet maker must have been when she was young. Mm, it is incredible. And but you don't you don't think that he would have done that knowingly. Uh, you don't think Rodin would have constructed that piece of sculpture knowing that if you cast the shadow at a certain angle that it would turn into a the lady in her youth. You don't think he would have known. I've never heard it mentioned before, so I think it must be chance, but I think that quite often genius does create incredible things. I think that when you've got genius a lot of genius is imbued in the subject but a lot of it comes out with chance uh, i'm always fascinated to see how great poets you know write beautiful poetry and then you see people interpreting it and you think did he really think of all that is, is there really that depth in in that poem we'll never know will we but i often think that once people accept someone as a genius they look for they look for beauty they look for something extra that that genius has provided and often that genius does provide it the impact Rodin's had though on the world of sculpture is is significant and while you know someone might not necessarily know the thinker by name they'll certainly know it by sight in your in your in your eyes why do certain works cross over into the mainstream like this and, and what do you think is the appeal to the, essentially the uninitiated those who don't collect what makes people able to appreciate art like that i think it, it really refers back to this portrayal of an emotion and when you see a great work of art it produces an emotion obviously in terms of how many people it communicates with if if that sculpture only talks to five people, then it has relatively little impact. But when you have a sculpture or a work of art that really communicates across the board to those who are perhaps not normally sensitive to art, but that particular image speaks to them, then it becomes iconic. For instance, in the case of a thinker, one of the questions that we all ask ourselves is, you know, why are we here? What is our purpose? What is the meaning of life? And the thinker represents that. The thinker represents mankind in thought really thinking about where we've come from where we go to is there somewhere we go to all those philosophical questions and those philosophical questions may not be um, a specific question but the figure of the thinker represents mankind thinking about philo 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 philosophy and i think that's that's the, that, that's why it's so um, incredibly popular because it's a universal image of man's thought process, man as a as a thinker as opposed to 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 animals um, who are existing, someone who actually considers their own purpose and their place on the planet. Mm. Do you think Rodin was an innovator at heart? Yes, it's interesting. My feeling about Rodin is that I think that on one level we see things like the kiss, which is again another iconic image. You know the image of romantic love uh, it's it's one of those images that everyone you see everywhere the, the embracing couple and it's, it, it is an, a, an eternal image of romantic love but actually my feeling is that Rodin is not the great innovator for the thinker he's not the great innovator necessarily for the kiss it's for his other works where he imbues his sculpture with an emotion which creates a, a reaction in the viewer but also he then says but look, let's just not look at complete figures. Let's just let's look at part figures. Let's look at a hand. Let's look at a torso. Let's look at part of a body. Let's look at what those particular things show us. And by minimalizing the human figure, by taking sections of the hu human figure, what he does is he invites us to consider impressionism. He invites us to consider minimalism. And it is from those figures, it's from those studies of individual sections of the human body that he examines closely that we then get the beginning of abstraction 
And the fact that when you look at our road, our hand, or you look at a road, our torso, it's not representational. I mean, it doesn't look, if you actually compare it to a real hand or a real torso, it doesn't make sense. The muscles are over-muscled, the fingers are disproportioned. But it, it's presenting the idea of the emotion that that image that that part of the body can create in you and that is where Rodin is important he is in fact the father of abstraction because he's the one that takes individual sections and looks at them in abstracted form mm. do you think that level of abstraction and impressionism is perhaps what makes his work accessible to people on the outer sphere of of that academic knowledge you know that someone who's not necessarily a collector but the fact that his work has transitioned so fluidly into mainstream where we're all suddenly aware of, of works of, of like you said the, the kiss and the thinker and michelangelo's david these pieces of sculpture that have been intrinsically bound to what makes us human do you think it's that abstraction that makes it accessible i i, I do uh, and i think that that is really a large part of the responsibility of the artist the artist is seeing things um, that by expressing it in a certain way, they take us on a journey whereby we start to see the possibilities of an object beyond our initial concept. And I think that's exactly right. And I think that's why Rhoda is that father, because had he just produced something completely abstract, we would have looked at it, the majority of people, particularly back in the late 19th, early 20th century, would have said, well, I don't know what that is, it just looks like a blob to me. But but actually, he did it in such a way that you saw the beginning of it. He took you on that journey. He takes you away from reality and starts abstracting things. And it's that journey introducing you that then allows you then to go on and look at someone like Arp with just doing a, or Brancusi just doing a very soft shape and understanding that that soft shape could be a bird or could be an arm or could be a body. Uh, that, that, that we now look at a Henry Moore and say, oh yes, that's a reclining nude. If you'd rep someone had produced a, a Henry Moore in 1900 and, and produced it in front of people, people would have said, well, what on earth is this? You know. And I think that's exactly right. I think he's that that transitioner, that ability that takes us up to starts us on that journey, which we then continue with other artists as we go through the 20th century. Do you know what the words just come to mind? And it's, it's a thread that occurred earlier in the, the conversation. Rodin is almost becoming a conduit in some way. He's, he's, he's opening the eyes of, of, of someone to see the world as he sees it and see if you can connect to it. And poetry and, and all art can, can, kind of must fall under this category in some way, do you think? Absolutely, I do. And if you think of the great um, writers, um, Rainer Maria Rilke and, and, and the philosophers of the period, the poets of the period, they were often associated with Rodin because they saw in him that greatness. They saw these great um, poets and writers saw in him this transitional period. Um, even if you take someone like Nijinsky, there's a wonderful sculpture that Rodin does of Nijinsky. And what happened was that um, Nijinsky um, does this, he creates his first um, ballet that he um, choreographs and stars in. And um, it's called The Fawn. And um, the critics go and the public go along and they, they go to the opening performance. And when it finishes, they just, they, they just don't know what, what's hit them. They, it's this bizarre, this sort of jumping about. And they're, they're used to you know, classical ballets like Swan Lake and things like that. And here is Nijinsky um, choreographing this very intense, modern ballet. And um, they don't know what's going on. So then Rodin then goes along to the second performance and he stands up afterwards. And again, the audience are amused. And he stands up and he says, you know, he claps, walks to the front of the stage. And he says, you've often called me the father of modern sculpture. What we've witnessed today is the birth of modern dance. And again, you know, here is a man that understands that, 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 that appreciates that. Uh, and um, I think that his fellow artists, uh, poets and writers and, and philosophers um, recognize that inspiration in his art. Mm. Now, fast forward to today. As yeah. um, let's let's get into contemporary uh, sculpture. You mm. actually, as a gallery, you deal in a multitude of works by contemporary sculptures. Um, so artists like Emily Young, Maurice Blick, Richard Hudson, 
what is attracting you as Bowen Sculpture to, to, to their work and, and share, share with us an introduction to, to the work that these artists are producing today? Um, the first point, the thing that attracts me, you know, people say, why do you take on a particular artist? Well, obviously, I would love to have, I would love to have um, you know, lots of, of, of artists work uh, who I admire in the gallery. So, but, but to a certain extent, it's a question of, are they fair to work with me? Are they people that are represented by the galleries? But um, one thing that I think is a theme that goes through the artists that, that, that we represent is what I call an artisanal quality. I'm not someone who really understands as yet, perhaps I will do in the future, but I don't really understand conceptual art forms. I don't understand, I don't really get a big buzz out of a series of illuminated letters saying love or passion or something like that. Um, for me, there has to be an artisanal quality. There has to be something that is being created by the artist. And I think this is what's so fantastic in someone like Emily Young's work, isn't that she starts off with just a lump of rock. doesn't have a plan, just a lump of rock, a chisel and a hammer, and she starts carving into this stone. And as the stone reveals itself, the folds, the colors, the striations, she starts thinking, oh, that could be interesting. That could be a nose there, or that could be an eye there. And she carves into it, and then suddenly something may change. You may suddenly say, oh, no, that's not going to work out. It's actually going to be a torso, or it's going to be something else. But there is a creational process. There's an artisanal quality. And if you then look at the other artists, for instance, Hanukkah Beaumont, who I represent, um, this is a woman who starts off with clay and just takes a lump of clay and starts modeling and comes up with an image which she, when she's happy with, she then has cast in, 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 in bronze. So I think that's the common theme that's going through my work, through, through the artists that I represent, is that there is, all of them have this artisanal quality, this ability to work, to create something physical as opposed to conceptual. Mm -hmm. In some ways, it's, um, it's the complete reverse of, for the most part, the mass-produced world in which we live as consumers. And the, the very, very nature of the way that these artists are creating things and the artisanal quality that you've described is the complete reverse. It's everything is handmade. And that process of exploration as they work their way through that material is, is has surely got to be the attraction, don't you think? Yes, I agree. I, I think so. I mean, I think, you know, how often have we people sort of walked into a gallery and looked and said, well, I could have done that. And I think the bottom line is that everything I sell, you couldn't do, you know, and if, and if you, if you can do, please come and show me your work because I'd like to represent you. Um, and I think that is exactly that journey. I, I think that there is a respect for craftsmanship. There's a respect for not only craftsmanship, but creation because there's, you know, you can carve something and it may not turn out very well. Um, but I think that's what it is. It's that combination of, of an artisanal quality, but also with combined with that creativity. Mm, I'm just just curious. I'd like to just dwell a little bit more on, on, on Emily Young's work. How does uh, Emily start her journey? How, what's her background? How does she get to a point where she's working as a professional sculptor and in the way she does and with the, with the, with the, the stones that she uses? What's, what's her background? Uh, well, she was in, um, went to um, art college, um, but then I think really sort of left the, the accepted art world and went and traveled extensively um, in India. And um, uh, she then came back and she was also painting and sculpting. And then gradually over a period of time, it was sculpture that really came to the fore. And um, the reason that she is particularly associated with stone is that she has this great passion for the earth and for its creation and for understanding rocks and for um, stones and marbles and how they're created um, she never ceases to amaze me how much knowledge she has about the individual types of stone that she's working and how hard they are and how soft they are and the different images that she could make so i think with emily with uh, emily it's been a journey of a combination of um, um, obviously an innate artistic talent to create, but also 
her involvement with the Earth and the planet and, 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 and how the, the whole of the, our planet has developed and, and therefore um, her passion for the stone that she works with. Mm-hmm. I think just to wrap up, one of the things I'd like to touch on is um, the the name Bowman is obviously, as we've said, it's synonymous with sculpture now and you've obviously built this business up over the last 27 years, 20 odd years. Um, and you've already touched on actually, you know, you were talking about when you were starting out and that transition from going from Sotheby's into your own uh, business, that you were wearing a lot of hats and you have to almost be able to do that by virtue of running a business. And is there anything else you would you would give uh, in regards to advice for somebody starting out as, as a dealer or, or, or as a gallery? Yes, I think firstly, just reiterating your point. Um, it is a uh, being in business on your own is is a is a business is something of multi hats. You can't just be the salesman or the expert or the, the you've got to do the person. You know you have to write out the invoices. You have to do your VAT return. You have to deal with the the landlord of the rent of the building you're in and all those different things. And um, I was lucky in that because I came up through Sotheby's as a junior, <clears throat> I had experience in all those things. By the time I left, I obviously had administrators who worked for me and porters who moved things and restorers who did the restoration for me and all those things but at least they understood how those things worked and due to my early accountancy um, period I also understood a little bit about, about, about accounts. In terms of advice to people starting up I think it's very important to understand where your skills are where your skills aren't and get the right people to work with you that can complete your ability. So, for instance, you may get someone who's the most um, brilliant um, dealer. You know, someone like um, Danny Katz is someone who is known as being someone as a fantastic um, and unique eye. But behind him are always a series of really good, solid people who do his research, who would handle his accounts, who do all those things. And uh, as wonderful as, as, as anyone may be in a particular area, they do need other people that fulfill in the skill sets that they perhaps don't have. Mm-hmm. Now, the, the, the other side of the coin, I'd be curious to, give, to, to hear what advice you would give to someone starting out as a collector. Yes, <clears throat> that's an interesting area as well. I, 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 my, my feeling is this, that if you're really going to be a serious collector, then you do need to seek out the people with the greatest knowledge and passion in that field. And uh, although that obviously sounds like I'm singing from my hymn book, um, if you go to um, auctioneers for advice, they are only selling what they've got, what they've been given to sell. And their primary interest is to obviously um, sell the object because if they sell the object, they get their commission. When you're dealing with a dealer, the dealer, specifically if he owns his own stock, has gone out and bought those things with his money or his or her money. And because you're buying with your own money, you don't ever buy something that you don't genuinely believe is fabulous. We can all make mistakes. I've made mistakes. But I do think that that's very important. And because of that financial and emotional commitment specifically to that specific area of the art world, the dealers and the gallerists actually represent an enormous source of both passion and knowledge far greater that can be found anywhere else so my advice to a potential collector is if you're interested in collecting in a particular area find a dealer you can get on well with say to them look this is why my financial position is this is what i want to buy i want to learn about things and a good dealer will take you on that journey he will say well within your price bracket i think this is something you should look at have a look at this we could, and then they develop in it. Now, have you thought about this artist? Have you thought about this movement? This could be an interesting area for you to go. And a great dealer will be able to share not only their knowledge and passion, but also their financial expertise at showing what you should be buying at the right time in the market, what things are going to go forward, which areas are going to hopefully increase in value, and all those other aspects. So that's my advice to any collector starting out Find a dealer in the area that you are interested in and make them your friend. Make them your, become a client. And you can be tough with them. You can, you know, as a collector, you can say, look, this is it. This is what I want to do. But in, 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 
in return for my giving you my loyalty as a collector, you must give me your loyalty as a dealer and give me some great deals. Find me some great things at the right mm. price. Mm-hmm. There's that word again, I feel quick coming up in my mind as I've listened to you describe that conduit. The dealer is going to take that collector on a journey over a period of time, over that relationship, educate them, help them make the right buy, help them see the beauty and things that they might have otherwise miss, perhaps. Absolutely. I think that's all part of that process. And I think, as then going back, I know that my wife, um, when I asked her why, why she fell in love with me, she said, you know what? I heard you talking about art. She said, I just, she was at an art fair and she came on the stand and saw me talking about something and explained to someone what I saw in it and why I thought it was beautiful. And I think that's what it's about. It's about being a good dealer. We'll be able to take the person on that journey and say, now, you should look at this. And the collector will say, well, I don't get that. It's oh, yes, but look at it for this reason. Do you see this connection? Do you see that? And that is a, a, a journey which for me is invaluable and really has been the, the central passion in, in my career. Mm, and that's it, isn't it? That's the eye that you, that you speak of. You were referring to Danny Katz earlier. That's the eye that the dealer has, that they're going to help somebody see something in a slightly different way that they may have otherwise have missed. Yes, absolutely. And it is that eye, it's that taste, it's that judgment. Um, and and that's very simple. I think you, you go into someone's gallery or go onto their stand at an art fair and you think, well, I quite like this stuff. This is nice. So you then speak to the guy or woman who has bought those things and it's their taste. And then you say, well, I, can you tell me about this? I'm, I'm interested in this piece over here. I mean, establish that relationship no, 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 there's nothing more than than, than a, a dealer enjoys than sharing his passion for for that particular object mm-hmm. robert bowman thank you very much for your, for, for your time and your input this has been a real joy thanks so much thank you thank you for listening you can follow and subscribe to the bigger picture wherever you get your podcasts To learn more about this episode or to reach out to us directly, please visit arcata.com.